And in this case, this patient had a mutation that had never been described before and activated. And so that patient happened to be started on an and had a dramatic response, a sustained response, that as we two weeks ago when that doctor was contacted us, was continuing to be so the question becomes, these are two really remarkable cases, cases um, by virtue of having really rare findings, uh, what could be considered maybe N of 1 cases, at least for the physicians treating them. But as we heard from Matt and Mike yesterday, they may not be N of 1 globally, and there may be other patients like them. And how can we, sort of as a system, capture the insights from cases like these and make them available more broadly? And it sort of begs the question, how many of these rare genomic genes really are as rare as these two cases, or these two outliers? So the first thing we did was we looked at our database, we looked at these 43,000 cases, and we said, well, what does the genomic landscape look like? How rare are these findings? So the first analysis we did, we said, okay, let's look at the findings that we've recorded on our test. How often is it the case that that patient is alone in that entire institution in terms of their tumor type and genomic uh, makeup? And it turns out that well over half the time, 61% of the time, the findings that we're seeing have never before been seen at that institution. So if you're a physician, you get a report back, it's more likely than not that the finding you're seeing, you're the only person in your entire institution. So that's sort of a local N of 1 experience. But what about if we look at our database, if we look at all 43,000 cases, if we just look at those 61% of cases that don't match within an institution, almost all of them, 91% of them, can be matched to another patient if you take into account this global network. And two-thirds of the time, they can be matched over 15 patients. Even more remarkable, I think, is the flip side of that, which is a third of the time, they're matched to less than 15 patients. So they may not be N of one, but they're N of few, at least in, uh, in sort of body. And what does that look like geographically? This is a pull from our data set of patients with another case that we heard about recently, an EGFR amplification and sarcomas. And we looked at that uh, distribution of all of the patients in our entire uh, experience of over five years um, who have been seen with this finding. And you can see immediately that it's not just a matter that the N is a few, but that the N are scattered geographically. So if you're, say, a doc here in Seattle, Washington, and you want to find another patient, talk to another provider who's seen and treated a similar patient, you'd have to go 100 miles to find that patient. You'd have to go to Las Vegas or uh, Nebraska. You'd have to know that that patient exists. That's the provider that you need. So the vision we had two years ago when I started at Foundation Medicine was, what if Foundation Medicine could use the power of this to help physicians who are treating these rare findings, basically rare, rare diseases, if you get down to the genomic level. What if you could connect these physicians who are treating these rare findings so they uh, other physicians? For the last two years, I and a team at Foundation Medicine have been building on the exactly this vision, and we just recently launched an application we call Foundation Pipe, the Interactive Cancer Experience. And one of the critical features of that application is patient matching. And this is how patient matching works. Imagine a physician treating a patient, uh, let's say, with breast cancer. Get the Foundation Medicine report. And that Foundation Medicine report comes back and shows an EGFR mutation that maybe is very common in lung cancer. Again, great drugs against EGFR. But now she's seeing it in breast cancer. And that doctor goes on to Foundation IT to receive those results. In the background, patient match has been searching our entire database, every single other patient we've ever seen, identifying other physicians who treated those similar patients, and giving Dr. Cole, the physician in this year, one click uh, access to the other providers who share them. Those providers, let's say one of them is Dr. Miller, receives that request in their own inbox directly from Dr. Cole. With one click, is taken into Foundation IT, where their match is pulled up automatically from their uh, from their uh, uh, case cohort, and ha is asked four simple questions about their experience treating that patient. 72 hours later, Foundation Medicine, patient Matt, sent an email back to Dr. Cole saying, responses from other physicians are now available for you. And now when Dr. Cole logs into Foundation Medicine, now she logs into Foundation ICE, when she goes to see her patient's report, she sees not only the genomic, not only the references and clinical trial data and everything that's been published, but now she sees individual physicians' experiences, no matter where they are, based on specific genomic matching of her patients. 
I want to make this real for you because as Brooke said, this is something that we've actually been working on for a while. We've actually built and deployed. This is what it looks like uh, in real life. So this is Dr. Cole's patient, Jane Sloan. She has breast cancer. She has a CGFR mutation. This is a report that she can look at. She can learn more about all of these findings. There's a second here I want to highlight, which is the patient match. Here, patient match tells Dr. Cole there are 22 other practitioners with similar patients. Click here to ask them for their opinion. Dr. Cole selects EGFR as the gene that she's interested in finding out more about. And when she does so, the system finds those other doctors, anonymized, crafts an email for her that de-identifies all of her patient's information, and allows her with one click to send this request to those other providers. Those providers, in this case Dr. Miller, receive that request in their own inbox. And when they click on that, they're taken into Foundation ICE. Their matched patient is automatically pulled up. And above that are four questions about their treatment experience. If they treated their patient with a therapy targeting EGFR, what was that therapy? Or is their patient still on that therapy? How long were they on that therapy? And what was the best response? There's an opportunity for Dr. Miller to add comments or add contact information if you want, but neither one is uh, expected or required. And at the end of the day, 72 hours later, Dr. Cole gets an email saying, responses to your request are now available. And when she clicks on that, she now has insight into other physicians' experiences treating rare findings in a way that never had been. And this is in many ways, if you think about it, a democratization of that those two case studies that I shared with you earlier, the idea that serendipitously one could make a connection just by knowing that this other case exists, we can make that a more sustainable, scalable, and useful process. And now physicians are armed with the ability to treat patients in a very precise way based on their specific genomic profile. I just want to leave you with a quick reflection that I think what we've talked about in this conference today, and I think many of us are excited about, we're really seeing the emergence of a lot of tremendous technological advances certainly on the genomic side with the proliferation of genomic um, technologies and sequencing abilities. The availability of novel therapeutics, we'll hear a lot more about drug development in a moment, but the availability of these novel targeted agents that have better efficacy and lower side effects, these are tremendous advancements that patients are now being able to take advantage of. And then for all of us here, the information science, the data science, these are critical elements and the available technology tools, um, like the ones we we're discussing here, will really change the way uh, cancer care and medicine are practice. And of course, in the end, it's all about the Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Well done. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure today to come and talk about, I've, I've had a chance to hear a lot about the advancement in therapies and science and innovation. And it's ever helped when we think about how do we take those advances? How do we take those therapies and bring them to market? And ultimately, put them in the hands of the patients that need them the most. I wonder if I can just back up two slides here for a second. I want to start with this notion about how we get therapies to market. You know, it's a big challenge, drug discovery, therapeutic discovery. But it's also a big challenge getting those therapies into the hands of patients. But sometimes, as we know, the best therapies don't make it. They don't make it to market. Sometimes even mediocre the therapies end up becoming the standard in treatment. And so what we focused on here at Zephyr Health is the ability to take those new innovations as rapidly as possible, get them into the hands of the trainers, I'll pick up on this word that Garau said, the democratization of data. That is absolutely at the heart of what we think about. Democratization of data. Democratization of data is about connecting disconnected data sets. It's about presenting it, as Brooke said, in a visual form that is intuitive. It's being able to make good use of data without having to be a PhD statistician or a data scientist.